But yeah, everyone welcome, welcome to 350 Vermont's August 10th action at the Burlington Gas Turbine Peaker Plant. My name's Allie, I'm gonna be your like MC, introducing the speakers kind of vibe today. So <laughs> um, yeah, I just wanted to first bring everyone's attention over to the sign-in table. Make sure, you know, if you wanna keep staying connected, keep being involved with 350, put your name down. We'd love to see you around more and have you volunteer. And then, um, First, I'm going to give a little introduction of why we're here today. Then we're going to have a couple of speakers come up. Then have a short activity to connect, get to know each other, you know, say why we're here. Um, and also, I know, I think we've got Liz coming around doing a, like, little video petition. So if you're interested in helping out with that, make sure to go find her. And then we'll take, at the end, we'll do a photo with the banners and end it all off. Grace and I will be doing song here so it should be a good time um, but yeah so why are we here today we're standing alongside our other two peaker plant stations located in both Escutney and Burlington Vermont across the state for this campaign don't burn our future clean power now we chose to be at peaker plants which are the hottest plants in Vermont that only run uh, sorry which are the plants that only run on the hottest and coldest days of the year because they represent the utilities holding on to fossil fuel and instead of investing in solutions that lead to a clean energy transition and a burning free future we are also standing with the larger national utility transition campaign that focuses on transitioning to clean sources of energy because climate change is here we're feeling it we felt it yesterday we felt it this summer we felt it last summer so we're here today to push these utilities to make that change, push for a cleaner transition, and get start moving away from fossil fuels and from burning sources of energy. Today's the day, today's the time, let's make it happen. Am I right? Woo! So our goals is to make the visible invisible. I mean, I didn't even know this existed until, you know, a couple of months ago. So let's bring some attention to it. Let's call on utilities to transition to clean and affordable energy sources, and let's also continue to just grow this movement by fostering relationships and getting to know each other today. So thanks again, everyone, for coming out. And now I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Give me a sec, I gotta switch pages to the bio. All right, we've got, first up from the Vermont Environmental Justice Network, Kaya Morris is a community leader, organizer, creative, and diversity, equity, and inclusion expert. She is passionate about issues of social justice and the protection of human rights across the globe. Let's give it up for Kaya. she her pronouns. I'm excited to be here with you all today as a long-standing partner and collaborator and rabble rouser with 350 Vermont. This is such an important moment. We literally saw once again the impacts of our climate crisis, feeling the tension and the anxiety in our bodies as the wind ripped and trees fell and communities that are already overburdened with the impacts of our climate crisis are once again reeling from further erosion of their communities, greater damage to infrastructure, loss of home, loss of income, loss of environmental protections. And it's all because we live in a capitalistic system that does not have an interest in protecting the environment, but is completely extractive in its nature. So I'm here today as a point of almost, it's not just a protest, but it's also a point of celebration. So when we, um, were, as a state, trying to grapple with the most comprehensive way to address our climate crisis. Some legislation came forth that was looking to build out a, um, a multifaceted process for people from the private sector, from the public sector, big green organizations to activists. This is how it was purported, right? And we passed, an, um, we passed a law that established the um, the Climate Council, which is actually a, a quasi-governmental body that's making major decisions around how we're addressing our climate crisis, who get to be the key players within that, as well as um, 
what are we believing the goals of this actual work were to be. And so when that work rolled out, what we found as we looked over and saw that the people most impacted by these crises were not in the places of decision-making power. There was literally only one person that could be identified as BIPOC on the entire body, but plenty of us, folks from the disability community, folks who are BIPOC, folks from LGBTQIA, varying incomes, folks who have directly experienced what this climate crisis feels like from the agricultural sector and so on and so forth, were placed in positions of advisory components. So not actually having the power that they had promised us, but saying we want to be able to kind of pat you on the head and say good job. And when we reached out and asked about that, was saying, well, so how are we so far from the mark of what you promised to what we need to do? What we were told was, well, we really focused on those who had expertise, and we couldn't find any diverse folks. Yeah. So um, it, it took maybe about two weeks <laughs> of me making phone calls, reaching out, checking in, connecting with people, and realizing there are not only experts right here, right here in Vermont, actively working right now, who are not engaged in this work. And so when we say experts, it's not just folks who have letters behind their name but folks who also have lived experiences, folks who have been looking at places like this, looking at brownfields, looking at the rotting infrastructure that we have and have had visions, ideas, hopes and dreams all along, but have never been asked on how to reach those solutions and whether or not the solutions that are made are actually applicable to their lives, right? We found over two dozen people in two weeks. From that group, a group of BIPOC leaders emerged forth and said, well, it's up to us to create our own destiny because we're not included in the conversation. And we wrote a really scathing letter that you can still find that exists that really called out the multiple ways that that effort was not only a move away from just transitions, it was an abandonment of the principles of environmental justice. And it was one that was not actually responsive to the people, the planet, and all living beings that are here on this earth, right? That letter, catalyze the movement to say we have to start taking charge we have to start including our voices we have to start taking our own actions and from that began the environmental justice network this was an exciting opportunity because it was something that was being led primarily by folks who identify as black indigenous or people of color folks of the global majority that said that we are invested in this work. Whether we are working in a university or we are working on a farm, we are here to do this work. That group has continued to grow, that group has continued to carry on in spirit, and that group is still here and is a part of this fight. And so I am thrilled to be able to say that we are now moving into the next phase. And this isn't just a, a sales pitch to say, oh, yeah, come find out about the Environmental Justice Network. It's a reminder to all of us of the ways that our voices get silenced and the ways that we have to take back our power. We have to take back our power. This exists. This creates pollution. This creates a destruction of our environment. The waters are poisoned. The air is impacted. The soil is no longer the same. This is about profit over people. And we have to end this trend now. So with that said, I am actually really excited to pass on the mic to our newest community leader, an organizer within the state of Vermont, who's going to be helping to lead the Environmental Justice Network into a new future and working in solidarity, arm in arm, with each and every one of you. It's my pleasure to welcome Destiny Pierce. Another round of applause for my supervisor, Kaya Morris. Wow, what an amazing speaker she is. Um, me, not so much, so I'm going to pull up my little scrappy script, if you don't mind. Okay. So, yeah, so my name is Destiny Pierce. I'm the new Environmental Justice Network Manager with. Um, so, yeah, so I just want to start by saying that there are people here that have already given up on Burlington, and they believe our leaders have too, right? And I'm here to tell you that I haven't given up. 
my supervisor Kaya here sure as hell haven't given up. Have you? Yes or no? No. No. No? Yeah, I just want to hear it again. Have you given up on environmental justice? No. Thank you. So that's the energy we're feeding off of here today. And I just want you guys to remember this feeling because believe me, I know it's not always there, right? When you're feeling hopeless and down about the lack of change, remember this feeling. That's what my steering committee partner, Earl Hatley of Abenaki Nation taught me. We talked about burnout and I asked him, with all your years of activism, you see some wins, but you also witness a lot of defeat, a lot of things that don't change or happen the way that you intended to. How do you keep going? And he said, you hold on to that fire and remember that we're doing this for generations to come. We won't always be there to see the wins. You set them up for the next generation. So sometimes this thought of mine rises when I just see kids running around doing their thing. I'm like, with the current rise of greenhouse emissions and seeing the effects of them, even now, will they be able to thrive? Will it be too hot? Will they have access to consistent meals or will food access be in short supply due to the floodings and the heat? And you know, I often hear those who are hesitant to switching to clean energy. And they say, well, it's expensive, so it's not that sustainable. But to our legislature, to those campaigning for governor, we don't have the privilege to worry about the money anymore. It's way past time to worry instead about our environment, our wildlife, and human lives. And to you in the crowd, you can support this cause in so many ways, and don't stop at, oh, I don't have the money to donate, I'm not able to march, etc. because, you know, all of that is understandable. Um, so the Environmental Justice Network, where we, where we come in, we will meet communities where they are at, Plus, you can share these causes online, word of mouth, share and go to events that highlight climate justice, especially BIPOC organizations that understand their land and their issues, okay? So orgs like the Environmental Justice Network are 100, that are 100% BIPOC-led. They will need your um, active, active allyship. Um, so my goal as the Environmental Justice Network Manager is to help this network connect with the most vulnerable communities affected by climate justice. Um, that's BIPOC and our model is going to remain and be intersectional. So that's race, sexuality, gender, um, disability, socioeconomic status, etc. Um, so again, yeah, so we're 100% BIPOC organization for climate justice and we're going to be bridging these um, BIPOC communities in our local and state with our local and state government leaders and decision makers. So um, once again, I just thank you for coming out and I encourage you to reach out and get involved with climate orgs like 350 and of course um, the Vermont Environmental Justice Network. Um, we'll hopefully soon be opening up partnerships with other organizations. Um, we'll be opening up our steering committee so you have a voice in our plans and um, goals and also as well as general membership um, to get people involved in different ways. And so, also, yeah, I wanted to encourage you guys to use the photo, the 350 photo and video booth. That's a really cool idea. Um, and a reminder, make sure you are registered to vote, please. The governor primary is August 13th. Together, we'll make our needs heard. Thank you. Next, we'd like to invite C. Green up, a farmer from the Innerville at Diggers Murph. And specifically some of our conversations after the flood. After the Winooski flooded again for the second year in a row, and we had done our best, my farm had a meeting and we spent a lot of time talking about our feelings. And there was a divide in how we articulated roughly the same comment. My coworkers, my older coworkers who've been farming the land for the same land for literally longer than I've been alive, all talked about mourning in different ways what this job means in a different time and a different context and with changing circumstances. And the younger farmers talked about what it felt like to have our biggest fears start to be confirmed. And we all cried. I talked about personally my shame that at the beginning of the season, 
I actually let myself believe that it just couldn't flood again. I was certain it wouldn't happen twice in a row because this is something that happens and weird coincidences of tragedy. And those don't come year after year after year. That is evidently no longer the case. We all knew that. And I think our sadness was that knowledge sinking in. I think the other feeling that I wanted to share was gratefulness for how our community showed up to support not just my farm, but other farms on the intervale. The way that strangers came out to help us was deeply emotional. It's overwhelming, but it's deeply emotional to have 40, 50, more than that probably people who I have literally never met in my life spend a day or part of their day working to help us save whatever we could. I hope that we continue to keep giving that to each other, and particularly in the smaller communities in this state where people's homes, lives, and towns have been gutted for what is now possibly the second year in a row. And the last little bit is that I also know that communities passing around the scraps of what we can hold on to as we try to keep our lives going isn't enough. I want elected officials that understand where and when we are. I want elected officials that are animated by the need and decisiveness to act right now, who understand that we have to ambitiously try. The idea that like it really just might flood every year is now the baseline for me in a state that I feel like used to get tossed around as like the safe place to live through the climate crisis, which was probably always erroneous, but, and in a country with the most resources to adapt to it. And I just hope we can stop making it worse. Awesome, thank you so much, C. And next we've got Daisy Bennett, who's a student at UVM, Winooski local and passionate about social justice in the intersection of justice and environmental issues. She's here to speak about uh, Rights and Democracy's campaign for housing justice. to speak about um, rights and democracy. I'm volunteering with them and we're working right now on a housing justice campaign and there's a rally actually today following this event. It's from one to three in Battery Park, which is right over there. And uh, yeah, just there will be food from the people's kitchen and speakers. Um, there will be stories from elected officials and community members, and I kind of just wanted to invite everyone here to come along after this to just stand in solidarity. Um, we're gonna just be kind of talking and sharing stories and talking about policy for Vermont, um, fair and just housing policy. But yeah, that's really all I gotta say. I hope to see everyone there. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks so much, Daisy. And next we've got one of our own summer interns. I know Elio and I have sat with the numbers, sat with the spreadsheets, so I'm excited to have them talk about uh, the forward capacity auctions and no coal, no gas as well in their campaign. So. There's a lot in the world of numbers, but we know that numbers are ultimately a value statement. Um, and I would like to give a bit of a value statement that is more important than the millions of dollars in profits that these corporations are receiving. Um, I'm so glad you're here. 
because we are able to witness the very past, present, but future of power in this area. Um, that right there used to be a coal plant, but it's not anymore. Um, corporations are killing our communities and they're using all our money to do it. And I'm over it. Are y'all over it? Yeah. yeah, over it. Penny Lane behind us, this building that looks like it's nothing, has received $14.6 million in ratepayer funded subsidies since 2010. And across the state, $143 million have gone to the top polluting bigger and biomass plants in this state. That's way too much money for killing us. And those very subsidies, they account for 10 to 20% of our energy bills every month. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Ripping us off. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money most of us cannot afford. But they've decided that they're going to put the price on us, and we're over it. We're not doing that anymore. Burlington Electric Department is not acting in the public's interest because it is not safe to have polluting peaker and biomass plants in our communities. And our earth can't handle us burning more things. That pile of bones was a coal plant, but we shut it down. Here is an oil burning peaker plant that we're going to shut down. All right. Woo down. Burlington Electric Department wants to turn it into a biomass plant. But we know that just because the color is green, that doesn't mean that burning it is actually clean. We can't keep burning things. Utilities companies are burning our futures and we won't let them. We demand a just transition. We will build a world where our kids can grow up safely without preventable climate disaster. Where the lands we get to love won't be ravaged by floods and mudslides and tornadoes and hurricanes and everything that should not be happening, but it is because of places like these. We will build a world with affordable weatherized homes for everyone, with great payer protection against corporate greed, with union jobs and livable wages, with the total replacement of dinosaurs like these with battery storage, wind, solar, and geothermal, and with proper demand response, where we strategically lower and balance our energy use so these places don't even need to begin, exist to begin with. We have a choice. We can keep burning things or we can live. And I don't know about you, but I want to live. Yeah. A better, safer world is possible, and we're building it together. Thank you. Thanks so much, Elio. Yeah. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Connor Wirtz. Uh, I'm a community organizer with 350 Vermont. This is one of the last events I'm going to be organizing under 350 Vermont before I head out. But um, I just am so proud and inspired um, by the change that I've witnessed is capable when small groups of committed people can come together with uh, on an issue with broad support from the people. And I've witnessed again and again through college divestment, through youth activism, um, through the concrete policy change that 350 Vermont and other environmental groups have been able to pass this legislative session, that change is possible, but we need to work, and we need to work against the systems and the companies and the people who are who have rigged the, the system against us. And so um, thank you again for being here, um, for expressing your support for this issue, and for starting or continuing um, the deeper transformational work of coming together and bringing our communities together and making that, that systemic change possible. Uh, so we're here today, this is a peaker plant, um, and this is really what we're trying to illustrate 
on these speaker plants as a symbol of the old and outdated infrastructure um, that Vermont utilities continue to hold onto as cash cows as they market and advertise themselves as green, 100% renewable, and sort of like the leading edge companies of our future. And uh, while we know and want to work with our utilities in this energy transformation, um, we don't want to isolate them. We also understand that it's disingenuous to call yourselves a green company um, when you're holding on to these fossil fuel plants and you're burning biomass down the road and you're um, doing that and publicly marketing yourselves as, as green and renewable, but behind the scenes, you're lobbying at the state house to make sure that biomass um, stays as a renewable source in the renewable energy standard, for example. Or you're lobbying behind the scenes for the Affordable Heat Act um, to have renewable natural gas and other biofuels um, count as, as clean heat credits. And so um, as climate activists and energy activists who have been engaged on this issue in Vermont for years, we have witnessed this pattern again and again, um, where utilities companies in many ways are genuinely interested in the change that we want to see, but at the end of the day, they're protecting their bottom line and they're really getting in the way of the change that we need to see. And so today is one day where we're coming together all across the state um, to tell our utilities and to tell our elected representatives and ourselves and our communities that this change is possible. Uh, we just need to work for it. So. So, um, one of the most important things that we're here today is not just to show up um, and to like demonstrate our numbers, but to actually connect with each other and to make relationships that will last in the work ahead. And so, for the next 10 to 15 minutes, we're going to do something that doesn't always happen at rallies, which is we're going to ask you to go and talk to each other. <laughs> Whoa. But it's a nice day, we can do it, we can be friendly. Um, and I'm gonna ask you all to go through three questions together in uh, breakout groups of around four, four people. And after that, we're gonna get together, we're gonna take a picture, and then we're gonna wrap up from there. Does that sound okay? Yeah. yeah. Awesome. So, the three questions we're gonna do, you're gonna introduce yourselves and just get to know the folks in your group. Then you're gonna talk a little bit about how has climate change impacted your life this year? And what are your hopes for a resilient Vermont in the future? And then finally, you're gonna talk about the work moving forward. What organizations are you here with? Who do you work with? Who do you want to work with? And how can you all in your groups make those connections to continue bringing the solidarity of your organization to your neighbor or your, your breakout group member and all of that? So, and I really encourage you, like, exchange phone numbers. Like, this isn't a joke. Like, I want you all to be leaving this with three extra connections that you did not make when you started um, coming to this route. So, any questions? Feeling good? All right. So, uh, break out into groups of four for the next 10, 15 minutes. Get to know each other. Thanks so much. I'm gonna be just like she. But I'm my girl. So. Yeah, I'm my own girl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're a good one. Thanks for being here. Yeah. What's oh, nice about your group? Oh, it's wonderful. Okay. Um, Hi. Well, I just, I, I'm here. 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 I'm
do a video that says, don't forget. Oh, I just took this off. Okay. Would you be okay to tell everybody to do that? Yeah, absolutely. Just give me the thumbs. We're making some moments left. I need everybody. <laughs> hey, everybody over here, if you don't mind. Oh. All right. Woo. Can you see us all? Jeez. Oh, right here. Hey, Woo. Woo. Yeah. 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 Okay. You all set? <laughs> yeah, so everybody over here. Everyone look at it. On the count of three, we'll say, don't burn our future, and then we'll say, clean power now. And we're going to do that three times. So again, don't burn our future, clean power now. We'll do that three times. All on your marks. Get set. Don't burn our future. Clean power now. Don't burn our future. Clean power now. Don't burn our future. Clean power now. Clean power now. Clean power now. I'm Connor Wirtz. I'm a community organizer with 350 Vermont. And we're here today outside of the Penny Lane Peaker plant, which is owned and operated by Burlington Electric Department. And uh, we're highlighting the Peaker plant as a, as a symbol of the outdated fossil fuel infrastructure that we desperately need to move away from to preserve our futures and our present. Um, this Penny Lane Peaker plant has received over $14 million in the last decade in ratepayer subsidies. Um, that's money that is taken from you and my utility bill. And um, it is slated to stay open for the foreseeable future. It's unacceptable. It's disingenuous for our utilities across Vermont to be advertising themselves as a green and renewable company when they're holding on to fossil fuel infrastructure and lobbying behind the scenes in the state house for um, polluting fuels like biomass and biofuels to be considered as renewable. And I think that's really the work in front of us as Vermonters who, who are concerned about our climate and our futures um, to be pushing our utilities and working together with them for a truly clean and truly renewable future. So I'm Henry Swayze, currently living and voting in Burlington. And the problem we have is that nothing we're doing is fixing climate change. And what we need is a movement to say, fix climate change. We're not holding our legislators accountable. We're not holding the, the fuel companies accountable. Uh, we're not ho holding the International Panel on Climate Change accountable. It's just how do we protect business as usual. So the simple message is fix climate now. And the secondary message is visit with your friends and neighbors. Ask them on a one to ten 
how serious you think climate change is. My guess is that some will be down on the bottom and some will be on the top, but they need to think about it and make their own decisions. And maybe it'll ramp up when they start thinking about it. So my simple message, fix climate now, develop a conversation, spread the word on social media. I'm here because I'm super concerned about the world that my grandchildren are inheriting. I have young grandchildren all around the country and between ticks and forest fire smoke and extreme heat, uh, things have to change. And I'm hoping to be a part of making that change so that they can have a better world to live in. I'm fairly new to Burlington uh, being here two years. But this group and the number of groups that are environmentally oriented have been a great welcome and really eye-opening as far as what can be done. Like in today's group, we had both college graduates and people of us on the mature side. So it's just great that we can all get together and take advantage of everybody's strong point. Hi there, my name is Duncan Kreps. I'm from Burlington, Vermont. And I'm here today outside of a peaker plant. Um, with an awesome group of people talking about kind of what this represents, why it's here, and the systems of power behind it that, can, that I mean, it continues to exist. Um, we're seeing this summer kind of shocking heat, deadly heat, um, natural disasters all across the country and right here in Vermont. And we know behind these are systems of power perpetuating them, perpetuating these kind of old forms of infrastructure like this peaker plant. Um, and yeah, we have a powerful movement here. We're working to kind of topple these um, and grapple with what our future can look like. So it's really empowering to be here and very proud of all we're doing here in Vermont and across the country. I've been to the McNeil plant demonstrating it. And any chance I get, I, I went into Manhattan and demonstrated at Speedbank. So where are you from? I actually get my Yeah. <laughs>